We're living in that time where it seems that in some ways, uh, the life is, our life following Jesus is more and more like a foreign world. It's not the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of this world, and the beauty is that Jesus uh, showed us how to live in a world that was not our ultimate home. And we've been walking our way through the book of First Peter, which was written by Peter, the apostle of Jesus, the most qualified person possibly to ever write a book because he walked with Jesus, he slept around Jesus, slept, Jesus slept at his house when, most likely when Jesus was in Galilee. He saw Jesus on the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration, and he is speaking the very words of God today. And so as we jump into the text today, I will say that there is a host of questions that will probably come to your mind as we jump in today, because he's talking about politics, he's talking about slavery, and if you want to continue his thought, he then talks about marriage, and he's talking about submission or submitting oneself and all three of those. And so if we were to add marriage in today, probably be an hour and a half sermon. So we're just going to start with politics and slavery today. Is that, does that work for you? Uh, but we're going to read the scriptures today. Typically we stand, but just for the sake of doing something different today, I invite you just to sit today and to listen to the scriptures as Peter communicates these. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13, and he says this, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Servants, be subject, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures suffering, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Be committed, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And Father, we pray that you would open our minds and that you would connect with our spirits, that we might understand the scriptures, Lord. We pray that you would allow us to see what Peter was saying to real people living in that world and properly apply it to our lives and our world. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So when you gather together with uh, family members for those big family celebrations, whether it's Christmas or Easter or whatever times, uh, you know, the reunions when we get together, people say there's two things that you probably should not bring up around the table. Number one's religion, number two is politics, and I just figured let's just get into it today as a family, amen? Uh, yes, we're going to get into this today, and uh, I think the question as we navigate our society today, and in some ways, in some ways, uh, our beliefs, what God teaches, becomes at odds with how the culture lives, and how the culture navigates uh, different matters, morals, lifestyles, um, uh, just how we live, there can be a growing level of 
dissension and uh, disagreement in our culture. And so how as Christians should we live uh, when government is not what we hope for? Uh, How should we live when the social structures are fractured and don't function as the kingdom of God? And those are just a couple questions that I think Peter is referring to, speaking of in the world that he was speaking. Uh, to, to get us into this and to help you to understand Peter's point today that he's going to make, uh, I want to give you an illustration that I, uh, at some level, uh, approach with caution. Because I want to put someone on the screen or a, a family on the screen that maybe you've seen in the media And this is a family that uh, has proclaimed Christ, and uh, I want to talk about them. And any time we do that, I get a little bit nervous about this, but nevertheless, I think it fits the context today. But up on the screen, you will see uh, a a couple coming up. Do you know who this is? If you don't, I'll explain. This is Todd and Julie Crisley. Uh, They starred in an American reality television series called Crisley Knows Best that premiered on the USA Network on March 11th, 2014, and has run or ran for nine seasons. Uh, The show revolved around the lives of Todd Crisley, a Georgia real estate tycoon, and his wealthy family. It was filmed in the suburbs of Atlanta before moving to Nashville during the fourth season. Uh, Now, this this, this couple has a family which also stars or starred on the uh, TV show. And you can see some of them. Their oldest daughter is Savannah Crisley, and uh, she is a former beauty pageant competitor. Uh, She won the Miss Tennessee Teen USA title in 2016 and then placed top 15 at the Miss Teen USA uh, in 2016. Since that time, she's founded a cosmetic company, because it seems like that's what everybody do, does, uh, if, they're, if they're, you know, they have that sort of media uh, uh, place, and, uh, and, and then she continues to be a social media influencer today. And some would say that this family had all the makings of a great reality TV show, uh, which invariably had mixed reviews. Uh, one of the reviewers from People, Tom Glado and Lisa Hamm, gave it a positive review saying this is the best family reality series since Here Comes Honey Boo Boo and the Osbournes. So you kind of understand if you know anything about where they're coming from. Now, I've never watched this series, but I've seen this couple because they come up in my Yahoo feed quite regularly and uh, I think it's possibly because, as, as you know, the, the engines that are uh, exploring the, the searches you do, I click on a lot of uh, 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 you know, internet articles or posts uh, of Christians that are in the media. And this couple uh, proclaims Christ. In fact, if you were to watch the show, I'm told uh, throughout the show they are claiming Christ to be their follower, there are Christians. Uh, So this comes up fairly regularly, I've seen it. Uh, But second, they are currently today in prison. Uh, In June 2022, Todd Crisley and his wife Julie were found guilty on federal charges of bank fraud and tax evasion and submitting false documents to banks to take out loans and fund their lavish lifestyle. And therefore, in November 2022, the couple was sentenced to a combined 19 years in prison. Now, why this illustration today? Because you've been given a platform if you're a Christian. Uh, If you're a, a follower of Jesus, you will be given different platforms in your life. And th- what Peter is making the case for as he walks through this book is he's saying, you're here to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you from darkness into light. Like, that's what we're to do. But if we're not careful, it can move from us proclaiming the excellencies of Christ to the world critiquing the inconsistencies in our conduct. If you're not careful about how you live, if you don't walk in the ways of God, and even when you mess up, ask for forgiveness 
and make it right, because that will happen to all of us, uh, we can end up with a world that is accusing us for inconsistencies and hypocrisy, right? And that's exactly what Peter is, that's his point, and he's going to illustrate this with a couple illustrations today, but uh, just to show this to you, I want to go back a couple verses to uh, verses 11 and 12 to see the context for what we've read today. This is what Peter says. He says, beloved, okay? He, he says, like, I love you as the people of Christ, as brothers and sisters. He says, I urge you. So this is not just a, an encouragement. He is urging them as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. That's evil, malice, uh, lying, uh, uh, lust, uh, throw it all in there, but he says, abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles, that's the unbelievers, honorable, so that when they speak of you, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now here's his point. There are enough grievances in a post-Christian world about the good that you will do with the world, that they don't need any negative dirt on you to accuse you. What Peter is saying is that if you follow Christ and you live for Christ, uh, people will, in some cases, hate you. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will also hate you. And Peter is saying, that will occur. But live lives with such conduct that even though they may accuse you, eventually as they look at your good deeds and they look at your life of love and service and all of the different things that you would live like Christ, they, some, will turn to Christ and they will glorify God. And he wants to prevent against people, uh, against our lives, uh, losing uh, our saltiness. Jesus said, he said, you're the light of the world. City on a hill cannot be hidden, so shine the light. And right after that, he said, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how will it be made salty again? In other words, you can live life with such conduct that people no longer respect you. It's what the world, hypocrisy is what the world finds inconceivable, isn't it? And this is exactly what Peter is guiding us into as he gets into politics and slavery. We're going to get into this today. But I just want you to see, let me just put it up on the screen. This is his point today. He is concerned. His intent is that Christians are living rightly in a pagan society so they don't lose their witness. And then he illustrates this or instructs us in with one instruction but gives uh, several contexts for this. And his instruction is to uh, submit yourself or to be subject to the authorities that God has placed over you. And so as we walk through this today, we're talking about navigating the post-Christian world with submission. Now, I'll just show you the outline for today, and then we're going to start walking through it. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the principle of submission. Secondly, the purpose of submission. And lastly, the practice of submission. I'm going to spend my the majority of the time on the principle, and then we're gonna finish it up with the last two. Let's start with the principle of submission. And I'll go back to what Peter says at the beginning. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake. All right, I'm gonna say be subject. You're gonna say for the Lord's sake. Let's get this. Be subject. For the Lord's sake. Why are we being subject? For the Lord's sake. Okay, it's for the Lord's sake be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors, and then he continues on. Now, it's critical that we get the word subject right, that we understand what he is saying there. If we get that wrong, which is the, the primary imperative, the primary verb here, then we'll miss his whole point. And so what does he mean by subject? Uh, the word subject is used in a variety of different translations, or, or the Greek word. This, this was written in Greek, and so what we have today is we have English 
translators that are trying to understand what the Greek word meant and then translate it into an English word that for our time and our place properly explains what it means. In the ESV, which is the translation I'm using, uh, he says, be subject to these leaders for God's sake. In the NIV, it's translated, submit yourselves. In another translation, the author or the translator translate, accept authority for the Lord's sake. And finally, in the message, which is a paraphrastic translation, uh, Eugene Peter just says, be good citizens. Be good citizens. Subject yourselves to the authority uh, that is over you. Uh, the Greek word is hupostasso. Now, I'm going to get a little bit into the Greek here just for a moment, okay? It's a contraction of two different words. The first word is hupo, which means under. The second word is tasso, which means appointed or delegated. So what it's saying is, what he's saying here is he's saying, put yourself under the appointed leaders, the appointed people to lead. It's used in multiple contexts in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 says, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. It's saying God's in charge, God is our, our highest authority, and he's put everything under him. In 1 Peter 5, 5, uh, the Scriptures say, Peter say, you, are, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Now, all the parents, all the kids, listen up, because every parent wants you to hear this, that you are subject. If you're a child, you are subject. You are to put yourself under the law leadership and the guidance of your parents and to honor them and all of those different things. That's not what this message is about. But uh, he, what he's saying here is that you ought to live lives in submission to those who are over you. Nothing in this world or God's kingdom works effectively without some order or authority. Isn't that true? We see this even in the Godhead. Jesus submits himself to the Father. In the family, children submit themselves to their parents. Societally, citizens subject themselves to governing authorities. And we even see it in music, if you want to hear good music. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to put a picture up here of a symphony orchestra just for a moment. Now, I did not count how many different individuals are in this orchestra, but I imagine this is actually the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and I imagine that if I was sitting in a seat like you are sitting right now, and they were playing right now, we would be in awe. And even though I'm not really an orchestra guy, I would love every moment of it. I would be amazed. Now, there is a, uh, a psychologist, his name is Jack Lipton, and he came to the American Psychology Association meeting one day, and he described, he had done a study of a orchestra, a symphony orchestra, and he was trying to understand what the different instrumentalists, the groups of instrumentalists, how they saw each other, how they perceived each other. And so he presented this to the uh, American Psychological Association. The percussionists, the other members of the orchestra saw them as insensitive, unintelligent, hard of hearing, and yet fun-loving. Happy to say, our percussionists are not that way, right? But this is how they perceived each other. Uh, they perceived the string players as arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. So I don't know if you, if you, you know, I, I don't know if you can do this and do this, but nevertheless, that's how they perceived each other. The brass players, they were just loud. That's how they described them. And maybe it fits, you know, that they, they got a lot of hot air and to play the instrument. Uh, the woodwind players uh, actually were held in high esteem. They saw them as quiet, meticulous, and a bit egotistical. And the question then arises, how can a group of people who have different personalities and feelings towards each other, different skills, how can they make breathtaking music together? And the answer is when they submit their feelings and their biases to the leadership of one conductor. And there is beauty in harmony 
when we submit ourselves to one another, when we live in organizations, when we live in families and in a society where there is order and there is submission, right? We, if we were to live in a place, a society, a home, wherever, where there is no higher art, there is no order, there's no submission, guess what that would be like? Some of you have lived in that. Some of you have worked in that. And God has created order. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. And even in the church, there is order. And so Peter is explaining to them that they are to subject themselves. He continues on. He says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. What he's saying here is he's saying, look, in Christ you are free. You're part of a kingdom uh, of God, and you are free, but you are still living in a world, and there are rules, and there are laws, and there are people, and you are to live your life, not as a troublemaker Christian, but as a follower of Jesus that honors, even in times that we disagree. Now, there is a host of questions that come out of Peter's teaching here. How do we live under a government when we don't agree with the government? Uh, Is there ever a time to disagree or to, uh, for civil disobedience? And the answer is yes, I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. But just so that you're not, well, I get it, but I'll just sort of, you know, choose when I want to follow the leaders that I'm subject to. I want you to understand the scenario in Rome. Because Peter was writing these to real people, real Christians living in the Roman Empire. Let me share a couple things about it. First of all, in the Roman world, it was filled with corrupt leaders. Uh, In the Roman world, there was no democracy. It was an autocracy. People didn't get to vote, and there was no free speech. And by the way, Peter is writing this to people living in this environment. The Caesars, or the kings, were deified by people and worshipped as God. It was required by Roman citizens to stand before an altar every year, offer a pinch of incense, and say, Caesar is Lord. When you did this, you would be given this little certificate, probably called a labellus, uh, which certified that you had worshipped their emperor, and then you were free to worship any other god that you wanted to worship, but you had to do that first. And you can imagine, for the Christians, the problem that that put them in. Uh, in the Roman world, the taxes were absolutely oppressive. If you think taxes are bad today, you would not have liked that day. They crushed people. There were 28 imperial districts in the Roman Empire, and they were ruled by governors and procurators. And I imagine, not I imagine, I imagine there were some good, a few that had good hearts. But we know from history a lot of them were evil, and they were terrible people. And it is in this context that Peter is writing these words. His principles, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, the emperor, governors, and masters. And if we want to look to the model of Jesus, his posture towards the societal leaders in which he was living, let's just look at that for a moment. Uh, Jesus never picketed. He never told his followers to march against Rome. He never started an insurrection or a culture war. Uh, Jesus' primary issues were with the Jewish leaders, religious leaders that were uh, so far off in terms of the temple. But in terms of the Roman leaders, in terms of uh, those leaders, uh, Jesus... Uh, did not take that approach with them. Uh, They tried to trap Jesus one day. Uh, There was a group called the Herodians and another group called the, uh, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, and they came to Jesus one day. The Herodians were pro government, they were pro Rome, they were Herod 
Odians, right? So they were big time into the taxes and ensuring that everybody was following the laws of the land. Uh, the Pharisees were on the opposite side. They didn't want to pay the taxes. And so both groups caught Jesus in front of a crowd one day, and they said to him, they, they tried to trap him, and they asked him, tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, if you're a Herodian or part of that crowd, then you're going to be happy if he says yes, and everybody else is going to be angry. If you're uh, one of the Jewish leaders in that day, uh, you're going to be happy if he says no, and everybody else is going to be upset. And Jesus, in his wisdom, responds. He takes a coin and he says, uh, who's on the coin? He says, render to Caesar things that are Caesar's and to God things that are God's. And so in other words, he's saying, you are living in both lands. You're living in the kingdom of heaven. You're also living in the king, uh, kingdom of the world. And you are to honor those that God has placed above you. You are to follow the laws of the land. And so the question then comes, well, is there ever a time for disobedience? Uh, is there ever a time to get involved in government and change government? Yes. And maybe there's some of you here today that would feel the calling to say, like, I'm going to join government. I'm going to get involved in government. I'm going to work together for change. That would be noble. Uh, we could use a few more honorable leaders in our government, couldn't we? Amen to that. Uh, but is there ever a time that we would disobey the government? And the answer is yes. And that is when submitting to earthly authority puts you at odds with heavenly authority. And so we see this in Scripture. We see this in uh, Exodus chapter 1 when the Pharaoh said, I want you to kill all the baby boys. And we see the, the Hebrew midwives said, we're not doing that because we know the truth. And uh, they were wise. They were wise about it, right? They didn't say, no, we're not. They didn't go to the Caesar's palace or uh, to, to the Egyptian palace and say, we're not doing that. They, they put a boy in the water. And that was Moses. And look at what God did with his life. We also see this in Gen Daniel chapter 3 where it was a little bit up front. Nebuchadnezzar ordered that all cit citizens would bow down and would worship. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we cannot be subject, submit ourselves to this law that puts us at odds with God's law. And so I think we, as we continue on in this post-Christian culture, we may more and more find ourselves at odds with some of the expectations, some of the beliefs of the culture. Uh, until that time or until that circumstance, then we follow the laws of the land, and we honor those. Now, let me just make sure you understand. Why is he saying this? Because there were Christians living in this, in Asia Minor, who were troublemakers, and they were saying, like, I'm free in Christ, so I'm going to live however I want. And they were taking the witness of Christ and creating a conflict with the inconsistencies in their lifestyle. Peter says, in this world that you're living, for Christ's sake, and that's not a swear word, for Christ, a phrase, for Christ's sake, live under those that you are subject to. That's the principle of submission. I just want to just be clear that it is not an absolute all the time. It is all the time, unless God uh, were to say otherwise. Let's talk about the purpose of submission. Peter continues on, First Peter chapter one, or excuse me, First Peter chapter two, verses thirteen through fifteen. He says, "For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance." Of for foolish people. In other words, don't give them a reason except a heavenly reason for people to say that you are evil. If they're going to say you, ev you are evil, make sure it's because of 
the good that you are doing in Christ, not because of the evil that you are doing in this world. Uh, I want to talk uh, briefly about slavery. There's no way, in fact, here's my clock right here, and it's red, that means my time's up. So, it's literally a countdown timer. So there's no way that I'm going to address slavery adequately, but I want to give you some pointers to navigate this passage. Okay, first of all, uh, when Peter speaks and gives instruction, biblical instruction, he's not giving biblical approval. He's not saying, hey, by instructing you in the midst of the slavery that you're living in, that I'm approving of the whole uh, organization of slavery. He's speaking to Christians who are living in it, who have no ability to change it. The only thing they can do is live for Christ in the midst of it. I'll tell you quickly about slavery in, the, uh, in that world, and I will just note, and I, you know, talking with Rashika about this, I mean, she just is, is amazing sometimes to talk about different aspects of the Scripture. She's just studied herself, but she says slavery then is, was not the same thing as slavery today. Uh, in that day... It is estimated that some 60 million people in the Roman world were slaves. Uh, the word that's used for slave here is not one of the common words. If you know anything about Greek or if you heard somebody preach, doulos is the common word that they use for slavery. In this uh, context, he uses the word o oikotai. And oik, oikotas is like your house. And so what he's talking about is he's talking about household slaves or people that were brought into homes and worked in the homes for their uh, leaders, for the homeowners or the employers. Slaves in that day could be anything from a doctor to a menial servant. Uh, they could be well-educated. They could be a manager of the state. Uh, they could have high positions and low positions. And so this is a little different than what we know of and what we often think of in the current context of slavery. It was an established institution. I already mentioned 60 million people living in slaves. And some masters treated their slaves like family members. They brought them in. They loved them. They cared for them. And others were harsh, cruel. And the slave had no rights or protection. To which Peter says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also the unjust. What is Peter saying here? Is he saying the posture to people when they wrong you is to not return evil with evil? He's not saying here just, just sort of, let them do, don't be wise about how you navigate your life and the circumstances you're in. He's saying, when you're wronged, you don't return wrong for wrong. You live like Christ in the midst of the circumstance that you're in. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, the unbelievers honorable, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I would just uh, submit to you that I think if you look at history, Christianity as it swept across the pre Christian world affected transformational change. I mean, hospitals, if you look through history, you know where we got hospitals from Christians consistently being willing to serve. Uh, when, there were, when there was a massive pandemic in that day and everybody took off. It was the Christians that said, we're staying and we're going to serve. And the world has changed. And slavery in that day found its end through, through Christian moral principles. Uh, the, the amagio day that every person is made in the image of God. And that is why even a person that you don't like, even a person that you don't care for, even a person that doesn't treat you righteously or honorably, we still honor them with 
They are made in the image of God, and they're not quite there. They're not living it out yet, but there is good in them. There is value in them. They are made in God's image, and so we honor people in such a way. And as we do this, what Peter is saying, as you live this hard life that's not easy a lot of times, what he's saying is that it's through your response that's different than the world that many will come to know Christ. They will glorify God on the day of visitation if you would live this kind of life. It's the purpose of submission. So we've talked about the principle, the purpose, and we'll just end with the practice of submission. And I want to end with what Peter then says to them to give all the authority that I think you need, that I need for this lifestyle. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. He says, for this To this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Oh, that we would go about this world with the posture of Jesus, protecting for sure, protecting people, but at the same time, with the posture of Christ, with the heart of Christ, amen?